I had an infection in my ear, hey. and one of the doctors punctured my eardrum, ah. and I can't hear out of one ear. Yeah. Uh, and I'm crooked. And, and, and you lost four inches. <laughs> <laughs>Well, you know, the first time I did Granny, I think it was 1957, and I wasn't old enough to do Granny. No. <laughs> <laughs> but it was fun. I did it for Frizz Freely, mm -hmm. and um, it was Tugboat Granny, I think, was the <laughs> first one. The song was uh, recorded by Mel, and he did both Sylvester and Tweety, and for the, when we were conceiving what it was going to look like. There was only one lyric that related to Granny, which is um, Tweety saying, uh, you know, you're going to bring the broom down upon Sylvester's back, and that we sort of hinged on in regards to putting her character in the short. So her character is in the short, she doesn't participate in the singing, but we thread her throughout, and at that, at that moment, she's sleeping kind of during the song, and at the point when uh, Tweety says that lyric, sings that lyric, she wakes up, sees Sylvester, grabs the broom, and starts hitting him with the broom, which syncs up to the, to the lyrics in the song. And at this point, um, June was already playing Granny on the Looney Tunes show, our, our series for the mm -hmm. Looney Tunes, um, and Matt was asking, he's like, oh, should we bring it? It's like, we're, we were saying June's working for us now. She's come, she comes in every couple of weeks and still um, is doing Granny. So it was great to have June back to do Granny, mm -hmm. but the fact is she's never left doing Granny. No, uh, <laughs> and I'm old enough to be Granny now, <laughs> and it's still fun doing it. I like it. So did you always figure you would work forever? Did you think this was, uh, did you ever think about retiring or? You just well, people it. ask when I'm going to retire, and I say, no, it's when they retire me. <laughs> That's <laughs> when I'll retire. No, it's fun working. It's just every time you go out, it's another uh, a fresh experience, or is it uh, just easy now? Or Well, it is a fresh experience in this year, but still at all, I'm from the classic times, and I'm still doing classic voices, so... And it's did you, the same. Yeah. Did you know you had this uh, this skill at the variety of voices that you do? Obviously, Granny's been around for a long time, but you do a lot of voices. Did I know it? Yeah. When I was six years old, I told my mother and father I wanted to be an actor. And they said, oh, come on. What do you know at six? So they gave me dancing lessons at first. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, I caught pneumonia. So I couldn't dance anymore. Huh. Said my mother was a marvelous pianist and a singer, and she said, "Oh, she's got to take piano lessons." Well, I broke my finger playing baseball with my brother, <laughs> so fortunately, <laughs> I couldn't play the piano. So you sound a little said, like Sylvester so far. <laughs> so they got me. They called me. They called the elocution teachers at the time, mm -hmm. and she put me on her radio show when I was 12 years old. Mm -hmm. And then she said, June, I can't teach you anymore. You know more than I do. Huh. So at 15, I became professional wow. in radio. And you, the instrument was always as flexible as we've heard it over the years? Or did you figure out how to do this variety of characters? Yeah, always did. And I did a, a, a two-year show every day for five days a week with Steve Allen. Huh. It was called Smile Time. And Steve wrote some crazy voices in for me. And I guess Capitol Records used to listen until I was put under Capitol Records under contract. And um, so I did the Disney voices, the Warner voices, because they didn't have record companies at the time. Right. So that, and then Tex Avery heard about me, and Chuck Jones heard about me, and Frizz, and Walter Lentz, and. I never expected to do voices for cartoons, and here I am. That's my profession. Did you have, when you started, you wanted to be on camera, I guess, probably? Yeah, well, a couple of times. Well, I did Green Acres, because I did so many Mexican voices all the time. They didn't even audition me. They put a black wig on me and said, call June for eight. She's got to do. <laughs> so I did a Mexican at the, uh, at the phone where they plug the phone right. in. Mm -hmm. yeah. An operator? Yeah. Mm. And so.
Wow. That was the last thing on camera. It's a legend. <laughs> we, we get to work with a legend. I mean, yeah. for Matt and I, and for everyone at Warner Brothers Animation, I think this is one of the greatest thrills is to work with someone who was there originally. Yeah. Um, we are, we're, we, we're working <laughs> on it now, but she's, she's she worked, worked with, with the, your predecessors. She worked with the guys that, the, that's why we have yeah. jobs. It is, in, it is interesting because we kind of get chills every time we see the credits right at the very beginning of the little short when we see Mel Blanc's name and June Foray and it's just as amazing, you know, especially me being a fan of animation as a kid and watching these as we all were and then all of a sudden we're working with June and, and we get to actually put her name up there and, and see this. It, it's, it's pretty exciting, you know, see the Warner Brothers shield come up and then see June and Mel's name, it is really special. It is really special. So is she a diva? Flatter, in fact. <laughs> <laughs> so is she a diva, very demanding? No, so no, Sort of no. kind of M&M? No, she's, she's great. She was just, it's just, it has to be a Bentley to pick her up at her house, otherwise she's, she's great. <laughs> now, June, working with June is, she's easier to work with with actually some of uh, the younger voice actors that we work with. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> she's uh, a pro, and she's been doing it more than um, anyone else, and she's still working. So it goes to show uh, that the talent is still there. And I, I guess it's perfect that she played a granny because she can hit the granny stuff better than probably anybody else at this point. So when you created Granny the first time, did you get, I mean, when you're doing the voiceover work, is there a lot of direction? Is there a lot of very specific things? Or did you kind of like come up with Granny and that was Granny that for was like it. 50 years? When I first did, uh, uh, Brandy for uh, Fritz Freely. Mm -hmm. He said she's an older woman and she's trying to protect Tweety. So I just came up with a voice. And he said that's fine. Did you, did <laughs> they, would they show you? How often would they show you the characters before you would do the voice? No, not always. Never no, or no. not always. <laughs> I, I first started with Chuck Jones mm -hmm. in '56, doing Witch Hazel, and uh, I had done Witch Hazel at Disney. Mm -hmm. I don't, well. Disney couldn't copyright it because it's a, I think it's an analgesic rub or some kind. Right. But when Chuck hired me, I saw Witch Hazel and I thought, how could he do that? The same woman, the same voice, the same witch. But uh, I, I would record a line mm -hmm. and I'd say, well, Chuck, should we do a second one for protection? No, that was fine. <laughs> they never directed me. Ever. What about Matt? Did he direct you? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it, it, direction's a, a loose term. I sort of just painted the scene for her. You know, I kind of explained that Granny's in a chair, and I have yeah. to tell her kind of what was happening in it. But you know, you can't direct June. June's going to do <laughs> but do, did do you her read thing. Lines for me. I didn't read. Of course not. I would never do that. Are you kidding? Some have tried to. No, I couldn't do that at all. Who's the no. last person who tried to give you a line reading? I beg your pardon. Who's the last person who tried to give you a line reading? I'm not going to. You don't want to say that on camera. <laughs> it's just hard to imagine. Yeah. So where did the initial idea of doing this whole project come from? Uh, it actually started where um, I had just gotten to Warner Brothers and. Um, it, we knew that, that we needed to do something with the Looney Tunes. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, one of the producers, who's actually on the short, said, oh, well, there's these recordings. And that I guess in animation circles, people had talked about these Mel Blanc recordings that had been done, mm -hmm. um, and that you should try to get those. And I, th I think it was my first or second day at Warner Bros. now, three and a half years ago. And I immediately went over to um, the legal department, and I explained what it is we were looking for. And I think it took about a year and a half just to get find out who had the masters and um, how we were to get it. Um, it was at that point where Matt was already directing our Roadrunner Coyote theatrical shorts, mm -hmm. where we brought in the track to Matt and said, um, Matt, what, what would you do with this? Um, what's interesting about the song is there's no story at all. There's no narrative described. It really is a duet between these two characters. It was really Matt and his team who created uh, the narrative and the story that went along with the actual song. And I, of course, thought that uh, June had done Tweety Bird. <laughs> My delusion, apparently. <laughs> no, yeah, Mel had done both Tweety and Sylvester. And then there was a, a, a technical uh, sort of snafu, is that the, the master, everything was mono. Mm -hmm. So uh, Matt and had to go and try to figure out how to extract 
the audio from the original and um, yeah the, the the lyrics and the music were married together and mm -hmm. so it wouldn't really play in a modern theater right now so mm -hmm. what we had to do was take it to a company and they use digital technology, wizardry, I don't know, NASA <laughs> scientists, but they were able to um, take away the music from the track, mm -hmm. which allowed us a couple things. One is it just allowed us to re-orchestrate the music, and then you know we're doing this thing in 3D and CGI. We couldn't have a mono track, so right. we, it sort of just enhanced it at all, and we were able to bring in our 60-piece orchestra and re- redo the music. It's the same melody and everything, but it just gave a, a it was a nicer package at the end of the day, and but it was, was amazing. The it technology. was exciting for us as sort of on the executive side is just to watch what Matt and his team was coming in with because mm -hmm. we'd heard the song and we thought the song was great. Um, and uh, except for Granny being mentioned in the song, Granny wasn't singing in the actual song. Um, and then Matt sort of laid out sort of what this new story was going to be and all the stuff that was going to happen. And I think Matt describes it as they sing, they sing, they sing, there's a smashing. <laughs> they sing, they sing, they sing. There's a, there's, um, a Warner Brothers uh, little violent punch to each one of these sort of very sweet lyrics. Yeah, because it's a, like if you, don't, if you don't look at it and you just listen to it, it's just a little sweet little melody. Mm -hmm. And they're really just singing to each other mm -hmm. and they're introducing themselves. And at the very end, they kind of sing together, and that's how it ends. And then when the challenge, the challenge was, how do I, you know, it's a nice song, but is it going to play visually? And is it going to, even though it's sung by the same guy who originated the voices, mm -hmm. it didn't have the same a feel as the shorts of the right. day. And in the, you know, it's the cat chases bird, and you know, with the violence, the the Warner Brothers signature you know, violence, and uh, I just felt like you had to have that in the short. Right. And then it would, the challenge became to sort you, you of... figure that out, by the way. <laughs> There's I, a lot of violence in there. We had to figure it out where we had to place the punctuation of the gags right in between the lyrics, because mm -hmm. we, we couldn't open up the track. <laughs> Bang! <laughs> and that's how we that's how you originally pitched it to Sam and the guys. Is, and then after they said, yeah, that's a great idea, then I went, oh my god, what am I going to do? Because then i got to figure out how to do this. Because you would come up with the gags, and then you'd have to back up and mm -hmm. lead into the gag. And then we had a lot of gags that didn't work because they didn't fit mm -hmm. in there. So The amount of work is extraordinary because not only do you need to work from a track that already exists, create a new story, but then you have the benchmark of the Looney Tunes, and then you put them in CG. Mm -hmm. So the amount of work that Matt and his group had to put this together um, is extraordinary because it, we all love the Looney Tunes. We all, uh, they're, they're probably the most endearing characters ever created. And for you to go in and mess with them uh, is, is difficult. And I think it's just a fantastic job. And what came back, and we are proud to put the Warner Brothers shield on top of this short and feel like the Looney Tunes were, were returning in a new way. So Stalling did the music, I assume, for the song? Uh, no, I, I don't think, think it so. was a yeah. different um, group yeah. of people that... Um, I think it was, the, and I think they would create these songs, and this song was a hit in its day. I mean, it mm -hmm. played on the radio. Um, uh, it, was, it was really fast. Well, the other thing they did, which I thought was great, in the art direction of the short, the recording was done in 48, 49? Uh, it was yeah, it was 50, 1950. Oh, 1950. And June one, of 50. It was actually June. <laughs> the, direction, yeah. the direction was um, from Matt and his art director is they wanted everything in that kitchen, everything in, in Granny's apartment, mm -hmm. and even outside in the New York City setting, the mm -hmm. cars, to feel like it was all created in 1950. So it's like time stopped inside that cartoon when that recording was made, mm -hmm. which I thought was a great choice yeah. that it really It's felt people like legit. Matthew. Who make us stars? <laughs> you're really, you're very it, sweet. It's incredible what you do. Well, well I, did you have a sense of what your when you go into the voiceovers in the 1950s, what was going to come out at the other end, or wow. were you just doing your work and waiting to see what happened? I had no idea. I just knew that I was going to work for the rest of my life, <laughs> and that and that I could do anything that they asked me to do. Because mm -hmm. I'm not head and splinter. I'm Rocky and Natasha. I'm Jokey Smurf. I'm all these with different voices. Mm -hmm. But I knew I could do it. That's why I told my mother and father that I wanted to be an actor because I I could mimic everybody. 
So was there a difference for you whether you were working with Chuck or Fritz or, or McKimson or, or Matt along the way? <coughs> Or Matt, <laughs> or Callahan. Is it? Do you, I mean, do you do you watch the cartoons afterwards and have a favorite kind of style or preference of one thing or the other? No. Uh, I, of course, I'm from the classical age, which I love. Things are a little bit different now, but the voices, you know, they're the same. One mm -hmm. thing that stays the same, though, because I started uh, before I was directing, I was a traditional animator, and mm -hmm. um, as an animator what inspires the animator is listening to the tracks. Mm -hmm. And when you have great voice talent like June or a lot of the other actors out there that give a real different voice. Like in, in animation when you're recording somebody, it's not what they look like, it's what they sound like. Because that's right. what, what, gets, what gets put into the tracks that we have to design characters to and animate to. Mm -hmm. And that's what's wonderful about the range of uh, talent that she has is I can't speak for those guys, but I can only imagine uh, how inspiring it was. You know, when they said, when Sam asked her, did they show you a picture of the drawing? They may have not have had a picture of, of the characters yet. They may have had an, a, an idea of what the character was. And then once she put a voice to it, they went, oh, I know exactly what that character looks like. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, sometimes we feed off of each other, which is really a, what a was, great was, marriage. Was Mel the same way? Did Mel? Was Mel directed, or did Mel just do no, what Mel wanted Mel to do? Mel just did it. Yeah. Of course, a lot of those things were speeded up, like Tweety. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. However, uh, I would record first. He would be in the studio. Mm -hmm. But Chuck never, he never uh, directed anybody. Sometimes lately, which is very disturbing, mm -hmm. um, Secretaries have directed, <laughs> and they read lines for you, hey. and that I kind of resent. <laughs> I I probably should, you know, that's what they're there for, their jobs. But you know, tell me how I should sound after I've done a a thing for years is kind of disturbing. Yeah. Well, you probably know the engineers in this, each of the studios as well as anybody in town. You probably have like a relationship with each of the engineers who run All each the, of those st yeah. recording studios. I know everybody in the world. <laughs> everybody, it seems. Besides, I, you know, I get fan mail from all over the world, from Singapore, from India, Poland, Czechoslovakia. See, they used to dub all of these cartoons in their language. Mm -hmm. Now, they speak English and they hear, they hear the original jokey smurf or mm -hmm. granny or witch hazel or whatever and they all have their favorites it's wonderful have you heard over the years somebody imitating you in different countries <laughs> with different yes movies? once i went to one of the times i went to italy i knew somebody at rye television and they were showing the smurf <laughs> and i thought oh my <laughs> goodness uh, <laughs> i'm going to get a residual they had dubbed it in Italian. Huh. Oh. <laughs> but that's what they did. But now yeah. it's different. And it's very exciting. So was there a moment of inspiration when you said, OK, let's, we need to bring Granny into this. Let's get June? Well, I think, I think the enthusiasm yeah, just you know, raised. I, I, I just think when Sam suggested it, I just said, oh my god, that's, that would be wonderful to have her participate in this just because of what we're doing with the songs and Mel. and. To actually have June involved was, mm. I just think everybody just kind of sat up a little bit. Yeah, like, it all seemed wow. right. The minute we knew yeah. we were going to have Mel, and then the minute that we were going to actually have June and Mel working together again, it seemed perfect. I know. We worked so many years together. And then you continue to do so. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's very disturbing. I was recording for Rocky and Bullwinkle at a recording studio, and Mel was doing something else. I don't know whether it, was, uh, whether it was for Warners or what. Mm -hmm. However, um, his agent was outside. And um, I said, oh, what are you doing outside? He said, well, we're waiting for Mel. Well, I came out, and they were inside. I turned on the radio, and then I heard that Mel had had this horrible accident. Wow. And uh, so. 
But we went to Bell's house to record. <laughs> he was very brave that way. Mm -hmm. He was in bed with all kinds of things on his arms and his wow. legs. He had broken so many bones. And he him. continued recording even from the hospital bed? <laughs> At home. Wow. Oh, at, at home. home. Wow. I didn't know that story. And <laughs> well, you guys have about the longest careers in Hollywood. I think I have. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's amazing that you guys are kind of the stalwarts who keep on going. You, I mean, you have a pierced eardrum, you were telling us earlier, and you're still able to do your work effectively. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I June, can. <laughs> June comes into work, you know, uh, you know, sometimes weekly to work on the Looney Tunes show. So uh, she, is, she comes in like any other voice actor, and she's, she's great, except everybody's much more excited when June walks into the room than when some, and it's great seeing the other voice actors react to June when she walks in the room. Uh, clearly, she's, uh, she's earned that place. So what's it like to dig into the legacy of Looney Tunes at this point? You guys have kind of taken on the mantle of something that, you know, as you said, we all grew up on mm -hmm. hours and hours and hours of watching these and, and knowing every character and every cartoon. And uh, uh, it's, it's, in, it's scary to do it, and it's important to do it. Um, and we, the, the original classic shorts that Mel and June had worked on and Chuck and Frizz, they are very important to the history, not just of Warner Brothers, but the history of animation. Um, but it's also important that, that we don't let these characters um, go away. And that for us, that they are our stars and that we want to keep putting them out there. And when I can trust people like Matt um, and our other writers and producers and animators on these characters and people who are as passionate about them that uh, we are at Warner Brothers, it, it's just important that we keep going and that we keep we do something with them. Um, and we've been able to produce six um, theatrical shorts, and we're hoping that we're going to continue to do so here. And is this particular the idea of doing this in 3D and uh, you know going to a whole new place intimidating, or is that just where we are now? Um. Well, you know, it's, it's certainly the flavor of the month, but it's a good flavor. We like it. And um, well, it's a very three. This cartoon is more three D than most things are. You know, yeah. There's a lot of three D out there, but this movie really uses the three D. Yeah, and that's intentional. We certainly want to. I think it's a great. Um, again, the Warner Brothers has a great sensibility for to exploit the three D. And uh, you know, and I think that. But at the end of the day, even though we're doing this in computer and we're doing it in three D, the the real thing is we want it to feel like the old shorts. And this is just another little thing that kind of pushes it out there. But um, we love it and um, it's, it's, it's very exciting. And, but we don't want it to be too gimmicky where it takes away from the material. Mm -hmm. So there is a lot of care and decision making into, into um, when, when and where to use it and then how extreme to use it. But, um, I didn't see any basketball players in this movie. <laughs> right, but uh, this maybe, maybe the next one. Yeah, maybe the next one. You but know, animation is such a wonderful industry because it's the nexus between reality and fantasy, hmm. and and it works. Hmm. And I think it will always work because people dream about different things, and that's what animation is. Well, it's always fascinating how kids can connect to it. Immediately, there's that somehow there's that uh, that factor. There's no boredom, I guess. Maybe it's the color, maybe it's the movement. I don't know, but it's it's there's that immediate love, and it lasts for a lifetime, really. Yeah. It does. I know a lady out in front said, "Oh my goodness, I watched Rocky and Bullwinkle when I was a kid, and I still love them." Somebody, one of the ladies who works here. Well, the statue of Rocky and Bullwinkle on the Sunset Boulevard is one of my favorite landmarks in Los Angeles. <laughs> well, much like what you were saying, though, <clears throat> one of the first, in the first, first group of shorts with the Coyote Roadrunner, you'll remember this, we had sort of an executive screening, and we're showing the shorts to the executives, and one of the executives brought in their eight-year-old daughter, and we were sitting around waiting for a couple other people that were late, of course, and then um, I was killing time, and I'm like, so, because... <laughs> Do you like the Coyote Roadrunner? <laughs> when this eight-year-old girl walked in the room, and again, this was going to be a lot of yeah. suits in the room, mm -hmm. and when this eight-year-old girl walked in the room, his face, he went pale, because that's really where the rubber hits the road. Because I was is, thinking... Are you going to make these... Are you going to make kids laugh? You know, or is it going to be fun for I kids? was thinking, if she screams, if she cries, or if she goes, poor coyote, I'm thinking, what are they going to think? Or worse, she does nothing at all. <laughs> right. like, I take any reaction, 
And it was it was music to our ears. We sat in this dark room and we played the Roadrunner Coyote, and this girl's laughter. Uh, it, it went through the room like music, yeah. and it was. And then the executive, as we walked out, the executive was like, "Man, you did, you did a good job." It was like we paid her off. It was like <laughs> she was just the loudest laugh and the most consistent laugh throughout. And I think it was just infectious. I think everybody started laughing. And, and she here she had characters? never, she had never seen him before. <laughs> she had never seen him. The before. awareness of the Looney Tunes it was is been a challenge. Is making sure that people remember who the Looney Tunes are, and. Uh, they're still out there, um, but we want to make sure that kids are seeing them in new ways and um, updated ways, along with getting them. One of the greatest uh, benefits to these shorts and the, the new series is kids are rediscovering the shorts again, the classic mm -hmm. shorts. Um, ratings have been up on the classic shorts, and people are, are aware, and kids are sort of seeing them again for the first time um, because we're sort of showing them these other ways of, of presenting them. Well, now you can, uh, I gather you're going to Blu-ray with some of them, and you're Oh, I'm sure there's a whole division over there who's <laughs> figuring out what they're going to do with those. Well, they're beautiful. I mean, it's interesting because I grew up with, you know, they were already packaged into those shows on net networks. And there were also some running on, you know, local stations, but you don't have those stations anymore. Right. But I remember the, the you know, obviously the color is not as vivid and it's not as well taken care of. And to oh, see they, them all cleaned up yeah. is uh, yeah, exciting. They're, they're beautiful. So do you have fil show, film shorts that you've done that you remember particularly as favorites or is it just you went to work and you did your thing and you know everybody asks me that <laughs> everything is my favorite I love all of the characters I do and uh, there's a little bit of me in everything <laughs> maybe a witch even who knows <laughs> when but, you were doing the Jay Ward stuff for instance did you think of it as high satire as it's kind of been known or did you were you just kind of going straight with it, <laughs> it we knew it was satire but Rocky was like a human being, and so was Bullwinkle. Mm -hmm. And they were the only animals who were really people who, who <laughs> were with people all the time and mm -hmm. discussing things with people. So it was very sardonic. Mm -hmm. And so were the fractured fairy tales. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and Edward, Jay, Edward Horton, he was wonderful. Yeah. So do you think uh, Witch Hazel may make a, uh, an appearance soon in the, uh, one of your future shorts? Yeah, no, possibly. No. <laughs> yeah, her, no, sister, no. her sister's on, but maybe we got to bring Witch Hazel back also. She's pretty intense, that Witch Hazel. <laughs> She's a feisty little woman. Well, I'm playing a witch on the new Garfield show, Mrs. Cauldron. <laughs> <laughs> and you just, you figure you'll just, when you, reti you retire the time you uh, really retire? You, there's no such thing as retirement for you. She's not going to stop. She's we never going to stop. We won't let her. Right, what? Jill? We won't let you stop recording. You have to keep working. Oh, no. I keep working all the time. Are the days you go into the studio special, or are they just days? Are those like the days you look forward to, and you go, going back to work? Uh, well, nothing is really special except that I'm still working, mm. you know, at my age. Well, we think she's pretty yeah, special. Yeah, it's pretty amazing to have her around. Yeah, I'm very active. I was in the Motion Picture Academy board for 26 years. Mm. And uh, I created the Addy Awards, which are becoming quite famous now. Yes. So I give back to She I'd goes like to, to every that. Academy screener. It is amazing to see her. You know, we're there till 11 o'clock at night watching films, and she's there watching them. It's, it's amazing. A lot of them are sixes. <laughs> <laughs> and have you guys gotten a lot of feedback from the film? Are you feeling that the the trio of films have had the impact you wanted to have? Yeah, going no, out with they're, it. They're, Happy the, feet too. Uh, the reaction's been very positive. Uh, people really like them, and the reviews have been good. And um, people, word of mouth, and the industry has really been appreciative. So we're very happy with the uh, the outcome. And you're in the shortlist for the Oscar with this one. So is that? Extra exciting, or is it uh, you too busy working on the next? Film? We're, we're 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 very fortunate that people recognize the hard work that Matt and June and Matt's team put into these shorts. Yeah, we're proud of it. We we enjoy it. It's 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 a nice thing. But I think more importantly, you know, they always say the journey is everything. Well, the journey on this film was amazing, and it was so much fun to work on every day. Um, it was challenging, but it was very rewarding and so we're just glad people are enjoying it. And we have so. new new ideas. We Matt and I just came from a meeting on our way here where we're discussing other things to do with the characters in theatrical shorts. So. And where will people be able to see them after Happy Feet 2 is uh, 
off the screen. They should. They do show up on video and Warner videos, and uh, I think there's compilations that will be put together with some of the classics that we'll, we'll see. With, so, do you want to see them? I want to see them in 3D. I want to be able to. Have they are. They're over great there. in 3D. They're great in yeah. 3D. But you know, Granny wasn't the only character I did. I did the um, Honey's Money, you know, where uh, um, where they who was it? Yosemite Sam. Yosemite, Yosemite Sam. Sam wanted to marry for money, and <laughs> so the woman says, "Okay, take the dog for a walk. Take the kids to school." You know, I did a lot of crazy voices for <laughs> Warners. Miss Prissy. Mm. Yeah, a lot of them.